Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, and we're so excited to welcome Hanif Abdurraqib. Um, and I'm personally so honored to be introducing him. Um, so I wrote, I've written this um, brief introduction. There is a video on YouTube titled Fun Things to Do in York, Pennsylvania, that lists throwing random objects at a ceiling fan among York's finest attractions. This is where I and my own poems come from, and this is why I asked for three of Fall Out Boy's then six albums for Christmas when I was 16. I thought I was angry at the world, but really I was just lonely in it. Pop punk was all I could get away with listening to in semi-rural Pennsylvania, but I took it. Next winter, I asked for and received a copy of The Crown Ain't Worth Much for Christmas, not knowing of its sprawling Fall Out Boy style titles or the music of its dense lyricism but instantly becoming obsessed with all of its poems. Hanif's other books include the, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest, A Fortune for Your Disaster, and A Little Devil in America, Notes in Praise of Black Performance. And when I say that Hanif's work moves me, I mean this in the most literal sense of the word. Whenever I read his poems and essays, I find myself picking up the phone to call a loved one or walking over to a friend's house, all because his language has reminded me again what love can do, or love has reminded me of what language can do. I love and learn from each of his poems and essays, and I know I'm using the word love a lot, but to encounter Hanif's writing is to be embraced by the miracle of what it is to love fiercely. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Um, please welcome Hanif Abdurraqib. And um, during the reading, there will be an opportunity to um, put questions in the YouTube uh, comments. So please feel free to do that um, whenever any questions come to you. And thank you. Yes, thank you, Aaron. Thank you for that really kind introduction. One of my old, I played uh, soccer growing up and most of my life I played in college a bit. And my like position mate, my fellow defensive midfielder was uh, from York and we would often go back to York like during holiday breaks because I didn't really celebrate anything, you know, um, and occasionally I'd go back to York with him. And so I have an interesting relationship with York, Pennsylvania um, and Pennsylvania in general, because it's a state that you have to drive through to get east out of Ohio most commonly. And I'm always so amazed with how I think most states that I've been in, and I've been in 48 of the 50, are like different states depending on where you are in them. But Pennsylvania feels like 30 different states in one, which is so fascinating to me. Um, okay, so I'm going to read some new poems that are um, attempting to be critical of the lens that police and policing gets in popular culture. I grew up in an era where there were, and I, I mean, now it's even more so. So I'll say, I'll say a quick thing about how these poems are born. I'm just gonna read through all, they're all the same title. Um, recently, I think I was watching like a basketball game. By recently, I mean sometime like a year and a half ago. I was watching a basketball game and there were commercials and uh, all the commercials, it was like Chicago police, Detroit police, show about SWAT, show about detectives. And I was with, I texted a homie and I was like, yo, the fuck, like all the shows are about cops now. And they were like, actually, they've always kind of been that way. It's just that when we were younger, like we were kind of indoctrinated to think the cops were cool. And I thought back to, I'm aging myself here, but like, y'all know I'm old, so it doesn't matter. But like, I thought back to like New York Undercover and these shows like this and like The Wire where you're supposed to feel some, or like, yeah, like New Jack City, these kind of medias where the cops were presented as cool and almost like unassailably desirable. Um, I don't really watch those shows anymore, so I don't really know what the cops are like now. But, um, and so I wanted to kind of unravel my childhood curiosity, investment, complicity in these types of media, and then maybe get to the heart of where I'm at now, where I would quite frankly prefer if there were no police, not only on TV, but no police in our streets, no police in our schools, no police in our libraries, no police, period. Um, but I think in order to fully embrace my politics means I have to fully embrace the evolution of my politics. And so I'm kind of teasing out some of that in these poems. <clears throat> 
all the TV shows are about cops. Me and my boys ride our bikes to the corner store where no one knows our parents and the cashiers got names inked on their skin and airbrushed on their shirts in memory of some niggas who ain't here. And every inch of us can become a graveyard after a bad season. And in memory of some niggas, we buy the fluorescent plastic guns and dip them in the black paint behind Josh's daddy's tool shed and tuck the fake heat in our waistbands like the hoopers who strip down to their shorts to ball but keep it close on the sideline. And no one we know wants me and my boys dead, but it is good to practice what it means to be dangerous, and it is good to rest in the grass after the bullet has been imagined and sung to life out of thin air by someone you love enough to roll deep with every day during a deadly summer, and it is good to be motionless under the tongue of a wound that could be anywhere, to rest below the thickness of humidity with the flies buzzing hungrily like a needle carving a name into someone else's skin. All the TV shows are about cops. Perhaps if your captor knows their way around a hardwood floor and a pair of kicks so white, they ascend upon being kicked into the dark well of a bedside. Perhaps if they once stole a toothbrush from the corner store up some block that looked like your block. And perhaps if they massaged the soles of their shoes with it until the white leapt back to life during a rainy season. Maybe if your captor has good hair and the pick points somewhere north, or if your captor was the architect of a mean mix and the tape rocked out of a boom box bouncing into a house party perched on a shoulder like a patient and merciful sparrow. If your captor keeps a gold rope chain in their top drawer for the nights they are not beholden to the uniform of empire. If your captor loves their mama or your mama, the distance between love and the ability to punish is a matter of perspective, says your captor who loves the hood and sharpens their teeth along its border. Maybe if your captor once carved their name into the brick of a building and then came to love the building more than the people in it, consider that your captor is as heartbroken as you have been once and so what is a little blood or a cage if you and your captor wail in the same tongue they will say perhaps it won't matter from where the wailing began all the tv shows are about cops i'm watching the time because i'm trying to be thoughtful of the question and answers which i'm always so much more excited to answer questions uh Especially now, I think, because I can't see anyone. And I think like answering questions and seeing questions brings us closer to each other in some way. All the TV shows are about cops. I crave, instead, the long shot of the weary hustler at the blood red doorway between evening and night, reaching a hand for the cold metal of a fridge that hums with its own emptiness. Yes, I have felt the sigh of the cop who goes to a comfortable house in dreams of the forest pulsing with branches bent into what must look like gang signs to someone with a racing heart and an eager trigger. No, I will take the shot of the hustler in a room lit by a single lamp. I will take the shot from overhead that tells us the hustler placing their stash in a box or feeling again that merciful weight of a gun with all its bullets still tucked like flower buds in the fist of a curious child. If there is a way to get your paper in America without knowing that the getting of your paper might kill you, then I don't want to know it. And me and my boys hustled because our parents came home and sat in driveways with the car engine still on like they were daring themselves toward another better highway. So the shot I crave is the hustler reaching into their pockets and pulling out an entire block's worth of balled up bills, someone's insurance money that just came in but not for long, someone's college fund for the kid who fixed their jump shot when the recruiters came to town, a fistful of gentle thefts. I want the shot where the hustler pushes the money into another hand and someone who loves them kisses the white ash from their knuckles. All the TV shows are about cops. Miss me with the story of the last meal before a person is strapped to a table. The pile of chicken that suffered a single bite or the tower of ice cream that melted around the dish while the murder was prepared. Miss me even with the story of the workers who prepared the meal or the hands that steadied themselves before bringing a blade down on the neck of a chicken thrashing on a table. Each execution is a meal that feeds another. Miss me until the prisons are emptied and their cages sunk 
into some untraceable earth, all their executioners alive, tasting nothing but wretched air while marching through the new world. Um, this poem is about, I'm not really big on descriptions, but this poem is about uh, New Jack City, which uh, there's a couple poems, and I'll, I think I'll read them back to back, maybe. I think they are back to back, or no, I'll read, I'll read them close to each other, that are about like, so New Jack City, um, and I don't know the age range or the like cultural consumption rate of those people watching, but New Jack City is the movie that made Wesley Snipes like big. It's about a drug dealer named Nino Brown. And it's interesting because um, growing up, I always thought the like undercover cops in New Jack City were the cool ones. And of course, as I got older, it's like, maybe Nino Brown is, I mean, no one's good. The movie is like, there's no real like quote unquote good guy. But if we're like operating outside the binary of good versus bad, which I, I choose to, um, most generally choose to, it's, it's fascinating how I've grown up and had my thought on Nino Brown change a bit. But this is about, New Jack City, which is a movie that um, has, I mean, nothing ages well, so it hasn't necessarily aged well, but I think it's still worth watching. But just going to understanding like nothing, it's important, I think, that nothing ages well. It's a compliment to ourselves, I think, you know? I rewatched the show, the series Friday Night Lights um, in the beginning of the pandemic. And I was like, yo, this is pretty fucking racist, it, which I still enjoyed watching. I still enjoyed revisiting it. But like, it would be alarming if I liked that show at the same level that I liked it in 2007 or whatever, right? Because I'm like 14 years older, you know? Um, so I think if we all get comfortable with the idea that with any luck, nothing ages well because we evolve as people, as thinkers, as lovers of the world. Anyway, that's my pitch for New Jack City. That's my pitch to try to get you to watch New Jack City. All the TV shows are about cops. You are supposed to want Nino Brown dead after the wedding in the brief moment when he swings the flower girl over his face while the bullets from his enemies make a procession of dust along the chapel steps. When he, set the, when he sets the girl down in front of her dying father, bleeding from a solar system of dark wounds, you might, for a moment, wish for the undercover cop to pull the trigger, but I have loved the dealer who prayed to unzip themselves into a child when drowning in a sea of shouts and sirens. I have loved those who wore soft red bruises left by handcuffs like an ancestor's riches when nino flings the doors of the van open on thanksgiving and the hood flocks to get turkeys the idea is not about goodness he who feeds the streets must feed the streets i most want the undercovers dead when i peep how easy it is for them to slither between two universes to vanish from the comforts of the state and reappear in an underworld of silk and white powder the hood cheered when the plain clothes cop threw nino from the penthouse balcony and into a pile of trash bags Nino's bloodied mouth whimpering through the metaphor. Consider the moment of the cop, mask off, whispering, I want to shoot you so bad, my dick's hard, with a gun shaking inches from the dealer's face. And so it seems desire is the axis, the child trembling inside all of us, screaming at whatever we've become. All the TV shows are about cops. The psychic with the glowing windows next to the pizza shop tells me the thing about the end of the world is that it already happened before you were born. So I wander through the poisoned leaves of the forest. From my bare cupped hands, I drink from the brown river that divides downtown Columbus between the haves and the have nots. It is easy to understand why America so loved the photo of tear gas winding its way around seasons, greetings, hanging over a street in Ferguson packed with cops in riot gear. Somewhere beyond the batons, severing of winter's chill and the glass being kissed into webs, one might be able to imagine a family placing boxes underneath a tree, wearing matching sweaters and watching another movie about ghosts. America loves its contrast, but never its history. The blades that feast their way through the tree's bark remember only the sweetness of collapse, not the joyful gathering, not the ornaments hand-painted by someone who survived a riot generations before the one howling at these doorsteps. Greetings to this new season of the bandana 
Ivana in the back pocket and then swinging from a once familiar face. I breathe in the scent of my own living to avoid the cars on fire, the way the eyes burn themselves shut, a seasonal greeting to the way my heart ghosts its own rhythm when I text, I love you, please tell me you're safe and hear nothing back in the time it takes for a person to be pulled from a car's open window to the worry that parks itself beneath the skin of my palms. My homie ran for a fence with a stolen cell phone in his pocket and didn't hear the cop yelling before he heard the gun go off. Or maybe there was no yelling at all. Witnesses say one sound can be swallowed by a louder, more violent ruckus. Somewhere beyond, a family places a box underneath a tree and begins to shovel the already ended earth, wondering if this is all the apocalypse has to offer. This one is about a scene in the TV show, The Wire, which I used to rewatch every year because I loved it. And I'm sure I still love it, but now I just don't have time to like bulk rewatch like seven season series or five seasons, anything more than like, I don't know. Now I just watch like, I need like a good one season, 10 to 12 episode thing. Very limited time to watch TV and very increasingly limited attention span for it. Um, but this is about a scene in The Wire. Well, not, I mean, it's not about that, but those who know poems know what I mean. All the TV shows are about cops. You can always tell which police officer is supposed to be the cool one by the way the cigarette dangles between their cracked fingers or by the way the cigarette smoke dances along a diamond ring or by the platinum chain their badge swings from, by the whip they push through the back alleys they grew up on. You can tell the cool cop by how they know the older brothers of the dope boys and don't drop government na names when yelling out a tinted window, how they keep the elbow angled just right when shooting ball, the way the coaches who circled the hood taught them on a court lined with needles and broken glass. You can tell Tell the cool cop by the way they eyeball the stash. Don't even need to keep a scale. Say fuck the interrogation. There is no truth that doesn't reflect itself in blood. Can tell by the song that plays when they put the siren on top of the bend. Something you maybe heard sliding along the leather back seat of an OG's ride. Know the exact way to order a sandwich at the corner spot and who to ask for the dirt. It is so seductive to blur the line between beloved and executioner. Not afraid to take the dirty money as long as street dealers don't forget who ain't doing a bid behind a stray bullet and I admit back in the day I loved the moment Carver leapt atop the Nissan Sentra in his black kicks and baggy jeans and offered a sermon of threats to the dope boys hiding in the concrete forest the way his tongue undressed the familiar slang when he shouted you don't you do not get to win we do um <laughs> I don't really watch law and order svu not because I'm like morally opposed to it, but it's just like, it's just not my kind of show. There's like a trillion episodes. I don't really know where to start. It's the episodes I've seen seem pretty like horrific and triggering in ways that um, I am not up for personally, but there's one episode of Law & Order SVU. For someone who does not watch the show, there's one episode I've seen like four times. And it's just like in passing, I'll, I'll fall asleep on the couch while watching basketball on TNT and wake up and this episode will be on or I'm on a plane and it's like fine whatever and this is episode on or I'm in a hotel it's wild it's this episode and it's horrific like it's an episode where someone like really violently harms their partner and anyway so I have two Law and Order SVU poems despite not watching it that I'm gonna read all the tv shows are about cops on SVU the man who set his wife on fire is shot with a rubber bullet because he wants to die and Olivia doesn't want to give him the pleasure. When he falls unceremoniously and puts a hand to his still beating heart, the crowd gasps with relief, thankful for the justice of purgatory. The script does the justice of dragging the sinner, breathing to their unceremonious ending, an audience to imagine someone dying slow, locked up and spinning towards madness. If there is no judge, no lawyer pacing with their fingers locked behind their backs, if there is no crying family, if there is no collared priests and no prayer beads dangling from their hands, if there is no glamorous shots of the sinner in a suit and then a suit, if the camera cannot zoom in on a prayer of forgiveness as the sunlight teases the brick of a prison cell, I guess then a real bullet will do. Um, and this is about Ice-T who, it blew my mind when I realized Ice-T was, was like playing, and I'm super late to this. I feel like there was a bunch of discourse in this on this like, 
when he first joined the cast of SVU and I just wasn't paying attention to it, but it blew my mind. Where I was like, yo, Ice-T, and Ice-T, to be fair, played a cop in New Jack City too. He's the one who had the like, I want to shoot you so bad mind that I referenced. But yeah, I don't know. Seeing him SVU was wild and thinking about his, his uh, musical career. So yeah. Ice-T played a cop same year he wrote Cop Killer and posed with a gun pointed at the camera in the liner notes the first body count album in the camera is the cauldron shaping all our greatest deceptions. Wrapped up in the right flow, the perfect scene, the right set of hands slapping out a beat to ride on the lunch table, I am liable to believe anything. I have seen baby-faced killers strapped into the back corner of a school bus seat. I have built the stash house and pulled girlfriends out of thin air. And so, when Ice-T says, I am not a cop and I am not a cop killer everything is a role i do want to believe that he has killed before or at least has sold half of what he says he sold even catching one body is a disguise that can last a whole lifetime ice tea's scowl raining down from behind every album cover and behind every badge in the show where he plays a cop ice tea hurdles himself towards the dealer who is barreling through an empty new york park and his fellow white officers follow steps behind and when the camera snaps to just the right angle it is impossible to tell who is chasing and who is being chased i will read two more i think and that'll give us some time to chat yeah perfect all the tv shows are about cops Two days before NWA dropped Fuck the Police, the cops were pushing boots in the backs of homeless people in Tompkins Square Park in flames hanging loose out of flying bottles lit the night like desperate tongues of distant lovers. And there was another heat wave that year. Uh, my bad. I don't know. I don't know what's happening to my... Let me start again. Because my I hit the wrong button and then it took the poem away. I'm, not, I'm trying to like not read off my computer ever, uh, but my tablet, you have to like shake it sometimes to get the poems to look right. It's a rough time. All the TV shows are about cops. Two days before NWA dropped Fuck the Police, the cops were pushing boots into the backs of homeless people in Tompkins Square Park in flames hanging loose out of flying bottles lit the night like desperate tongues of distant lovers. And there was another heat wave that year. And Pop said, you could stand on the roof of our project building and see Yellowstone burning from miles away. Power is what whispers through the blackened air and lets you know how close you are to exile. Two days before NWA dropped Fuck the Police, someone was dragged out of an apartment they no longer had the money for and someone else got cuffed for stealing milk and someone on my block beat the blood out of their knuckles against a brick wall that was not an enemy or not the boss that did them wrong and restraint I hear is Christ-like what will you do with your rage when fastened to the immovable monument of the state two days before NWA dropped fuck the police there was someone locking their car door in an unfamiliar neighborhood and someone else pointing at black kids and assigning them killers so fuck the FBI gonna do except what it's gonna do I feel nothing when watching the videos of the outraged masses throwing the black vinyl records into the fires and I feel nothing when the vinyl bends backwards and screams underneath the heat of summer. In 88, and the whole country stumbled over itself to be dressed in fire and people threw NWA records into the streets and people threw NWA records into the burning parks and broke the records into small pieces and put them into flaming bottles and there is no ocean I can dip my hands into that will undo these memories. There is nothing I can remember clearer than that first music, that clattering desperation spilling from a desire for silence this is the last one and then i would and i will say too that folks can like ask questions about the poems and like not just poems i read but like poems in general or the world of poems but you can also just ask me what i'm pretty open to questions in general like i'm a you know the thing that I always try to impart on people is that we're all many different things before we're writers. Like we're all multiple things before we are people who write. And so um, whenever I do Q and A's, I think that fulfilling that is important, fulfilling that nature of the reality that I am also a, a music fan and I'm also a sports fan and I'm also a dog owner and I'm also a person who loves many things. So you can ask kind of any questions you want and I'm glad to hear them all. This is the last one I'll read. Um, it's in two parts, but I'm not going to count them out. All the TV shows are about cops. I miss ritual more than I miss religion. 
It is good to have somewhere to be and a song that carries you there to drift into a dream while bent, face pressed to the ground. The carpet in my grandfather's house smelled like the cigarettes he told my mother he'd long sworn off. Pray not to God, but to the lies your people tell each other to survive. If there is a heaven, let it be a heaven not of people, but a heaven of those lies, breathing beyond the people who told them across the table or gently blew them into an ear. A heaven of cigarette butts in the shape of a heavy white beard, a heaven of cash in cars, in gold rings. If my myths outlive me, I carve out a corner of heaven for the lies I've told with a flashlight in my eyes or beaming into my car. I carve out a corner for the way I treated the black judge like kin while he scanned my record and considered a sentence. More than I miss religion, I miss how easy it is to be forgiven when the altar beckons five times a day. A corner of heaven for the Arabic I've tripped over on a path to forgiveness. A corner for the imagined girlfriends turning over in my brain during the silent prayers. Even my pleas are lies. Even when I know what I've done, I can't bring myself to speak its name. No one thinks God would wear a badge or spend a Sunday cleaning weapons while people fainted into the aisles of a church in the name of something holy. I don't believe in God as much as I believe in an interrogation room. I believe in someone placing a loaded gun on a metal table between me and a door. And who gets to be God then? Would God be the bullet or the table or the door? But maybe I'm getting too caught up in the romantics of power again. All the police officers from my hood went to church in the mornings and helped old women up the stairs and into their pews before receiving the word. Cleanliness is a soft palm which turns a face towards its righteous path, and so keeping the streets clean is an act of God. No one thinks God would push a face into the mud while saying, you want to die today? So low the onlookers can't hear, but maybe we're all playing dress up and paying our tithes where we can. Maybe there is no devil in just a hundred different ways to be the wrong kind of God. Maybe if there are enough candles lighting the concrete's blood, someone might mistake these memorials for a type of prayer. Thanks, y'all. Thank you so much. I just want to say like infinite snaps because I feel like I imagine it would be so difficult to read and to not hear any kind of response at all. Um, so I, I, I was muted, but I was, I was really feeling all of that. So thank you so much for sharing, you. for sharing like in these circumstances. I've gotten so used to it, you know, I've gotten so used to like the <laughs> Although I do miss the sounds in the in everything of the world, uh, the living, breathing world of like reading, I, I do. I have gotten weirdly used to like just reading alone in my house and <laughs> hoping that people are not hating it. Um, well, it seems like from the questions we've been getting that people are really excited about your work as they should be. Um, but our first question is from Jayla Rhodes, who asks, just a curiosity question, what made you decide to give each of these poems the same name? Oh, because I'm lazy. Um, <laughs> mostly. I mean, I did that in my last book, too. I, you know, I, I think, like, um, a thing that's real is I also, I mean, the, a better answer to really honor that question, which is a good question. Thank you for asking me, Jayla. Um, and so to honor, I mean, I'm also someone who has reformatted my ideas around productivity and what it is to write a poem. Like mm -hmm. I used to think if I write one poem, then I'm done with this idea, mm -hmm. right? I've written the poem and I feel like this is because, um, and I say this not at all to disparage slam. I owe it. I owe the, the debt I owe to slam, which I came up in slam. Right. And so the debt I owe to slam is immense. And I still, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have a book. I wouldn't be writing poems still. You know, the, getting into slam was what made me a poet and what defined my work as a poet was slam. And what defined my ability to figure out my strengths as a poet was slam because mm -hmm. it was like the miracle of slam still to me now is that when something works, you get immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. If you read the same poem in five rooms and like in each of those rooms, someone responds affirmatively at the same spot, then it's like, oh, this is something I'm doing well. So it's like that immediate feedback shaped me as a poet. But I also think that um, because having a slam, a diverse catalog of work at the time I was coming up in slam was so important. It's kind of like, all right, I wrote this one poem about this and I'm moving on to this other poem about this. And now I'm thinking so much more slowly and saying, well, I've explored this idea in one poem. But that doesn't mean I'm finished with the poem. It means I'm finished with this shade of the poem. Mm -hmm. But if I'm thinking about this like a color wheel, uh, color wheel of my curiosities, I need to kind of fill in that the rest of the wheel. 
Mm-hmm. I need to kind of add, I need to make this experience kaleidoscopic. Therefore, I'm giving myself permission to say, I'm not really done with this poem. And naming a poem the same thing for me. And when I worked on these, I just put, um, I opened 20 different Word docs and just put the title at the top of each of them. Mm. And just said, this is, this is, I want to return to this. It was a, it was a, it was a way to make myself feel like I was returning to an ongoing project and not just saying, well, I'm done with this poem. Good times. So yeah, that that's part of it too. Yeah. No, I'm just thinking about that. And um, I feel like there's this sense, like being in a capitalist society that we have to only have like one, one poem equals one idea. Um, but I, again, like also am really drawn to the idea of obsessions that we return to. Yeah. Um, our next question is from um, Mandana. Apologies if I'm saying you're wrong, your name wrong. But um, Mandana says, I heart your poetry. I also adored A Little Devil in America. Would you discuss your work across genres and how you choose to express yourself? Your prose is so sonic and in brilliant motion that it's poetry too. Well, thanks for reading A Little Devil. You know, it's so funny because in my brain, it just came out. And I forget that people just read really generously and really quickly. Like so many people have hit me up and been like, I've read A Little Devil in Mary and like have really read, <laughs> like are giving me like stuff from the last essay where it's like, I love this and this and this. I'm like, damn, you know, for <laughs> a joint like just came out. Uh, <laughs> like I'm still thumbing through, you know, the, a book I love that came out on the same day as mine is Melissa Feebos' Girlhood. Mm. And I'm still like only halfway through that joint. So thank <laughs> you for spending time with Little Devil. Um, one thing I always say that's true to me now, perhaps truer than ever, is that I'm not really beholden the genre. And I don't really think of the pursuit of curiosities and excitements and obsessions through the lens of genre, which is more freeing to me. I actually oftentimes don't know what genre I'm pursuing in my work until about halfway through a page. And even then, Mm -hmm. I give myself the permission to alter it at any point, you know, Um, which means that sometimes I'll draft an essay and then in editing, I'll realize I've drafted a poem. It also helps me and serves me that I don't throw away anything. I have a folder that acts as kind of like a discard pile on my computer that now is like teeming with stuff from 2015 to present. Um, Because that's, and this doesn't say that everything I write is useful. Much of that shit, like to be clear, much of that stuff is like not useful. But every now and then I will say I'm stuck on this. And I remember that I kind of tried to kick this can down the road in 2017. I wonder what I was thinking then that could be applied to the present. I mean, there are, there are parts of Little Devil that I used things from 2016, from 2017, from working on A Fortune Free Disaster, from working on They Can't Kill Us Till They Kill Us. The, the good fortune of having one's politics evolve, right, for example, is being like, I don't know if I was ready to write this then, but I think I'm ready to try it now. And so that's more what I'm governed by, this kind of insatiable desire to evolve and to understand that in order to evolve as both a writer, thinker, person, liver in the world, I need to think beyond the binaries of genre. And I need to to afford myself the range and ability to sometimes weave in and out of execution of thought, no matter how I, that means that sometimes a poem will show up in the middle of an essay, if, if that's what I'm, you know, I, I, I need to allow myself the leeway to evolve my thinking because left to my own devices, I don't know if I, if I do it very well. Hmm. Um, our next question is from Andres Gonzalez Bonillas. Um, and he says, tell us about the albums behind you. And to add to that, I recently watched your interview with Nate Marshall and I saw that you had some different LPs. So um, I would yeah. love to hear about how you change them up or like what, yeah, yeah. how you set well, up that I, space. Yeah, shout out to Andres. I love that question. Thank you. I, this is, it's a really unspectacular answer in terms of why. So I have, this has become, you know, when COVID started, um I needed to set up like a room in my home that was like catch all so this is my office and my recording studio and weirdly now my home gym (laughs) and um and sometimes my like listening room so I have a record player in here I have two record I have three record players in my house two of them at work one of them's in here and one is in my living room and these this is just like my rotation um I don't always listen to records in here but I like having a rotation and uh, yeah, so I've, I've swapped out recently. 
I got uh, Wire's Chairs Missing, which I think is the greatest Wire album, although I think a lot of folks think Pink Flag is better, which I would not argue with. Pink Flag is great. Um, Emotion by Carly Rae, Jepsen, because it's spring. Um, <laughs> Stylistics, You Are Beautiful. Stylistics, which, you know, is like a, a real Philly soul group, so it's fitting for this perhaps. Um, X-Ray Specs by, uh, or I'm sorry, Germ Free Adolescence by X-Ray Specs, because there's there's like a polystyrene documentary coming out that I got to get my hands on, because, you know, like, when I think about Black women in punk, obviously, like, the list is long, and um, these stories are mostly undertold, but I just have such a large heart for polystyrene in X-Ray Specs. Um, and Martha and the Vandellas' Black Magic, which is their final album, and actually one of my favorite full albums in there. So that's my rotation for the moment. Um, we have another question. Um, this one's from Kerwin Sutherland, who asks... Oh, word? <laughs> Shout out to... Yo, I didn't know Kerwin was here. Um, yeah, Kerwin asks, can you talk about the inception of Object of Sound? What inspired you to start the podcast? Is there a specific hope you have for listeners to take away? Yo, Kerwin is, is uh, not only a, a, a favorite writer of mine, but a, like, really, I remember, I'll never forget the first time I saw Kerwin like, perform writing. Uh, and I think just like, the, the, and I haven't seen Kerwin in years because not just pandemic, but you know, just the nature of living in different places and whatnot, but just the Kerwin's performance is just like haunting always and mm. um, have spent so much time with Kerwin's work and appreciate it a great deal. Object sound. Um, you know, I, <laughs> this is corny maybe, but I always wanted to be like a college radio DJ back in a time when that was like plausible. I don't really know if it's as plausible now, but, you know, when I was coming up, I was like, and I came up in an era of, you know, I was a kid in the 90s um, living in Columbus, Ohio, which is a huge college town. So I came up in the midst of like this college radio boom in a way where like a lot of the music that I got as a kid was funneled to me through college radio, everything. I'm not just talking about mm -hmm. like, quote unquote, alternative music, but like first time I heard the Fugees is on college radio, you mm -hmm. know, first time I heard Bahamadia was on college radio. The Roots was on college radio, um, just as easy, just as much as like the first time I heard like Alice in Chains was on college radio, these kind of things. And I just thought like, there was something so great about the power that a college radio DJ had where they didn't have to like adhere to the, the station norms and could just be like, I got records and I'm going to play them. Like if I want to play Jesus and Mary Chain and then follow up by playing like the entirety of Do You Want More, that's what's going to happen, you know? I was like, yo, that is a gig gig, you know, like that's, that's it for me. Um, Cause it's not even so many of the DJs that I heard in that, in, especially in the Midwest were so generous. It wasn't like I'm imparting my wisdom on you or I'm like forcing you to listen to my music. It was like, I'm so excited about these songs and I cannot hold myself back from sharing them with you, which is actually so much of my music listening practice and music sharing practice. <laughs> I mean, I've gone on and on about this, but something that really bugged me, um, and I know a lot of people liked it and were upset when it got canceled, but like, and I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Zoe Kravitz. Like, let's, let's just get that out of the way. Um, but something that really bugged me about high, the High Fidelity reboot, um, there were some things I liked about it, but the thing that bugged me is that media-wise, the way that music fans are portrayed in the media, we haven't moved past these like whack-ass tropes of, of music fans being these like, hyper elitist just immensely harmfully snobbish people who have like no social graces outside of talking about music references you know mm -hmm. what i mean and that's just like not the world that i inhabit or wanted to grow up in as a music fan as a fan and lover of music i want to be like yo i heard something so incredible and i cannot wait to share it with you even if you don't fuck with it i hope that it like brings you something else i got uh, and i know that this is a roundabout way of getting to the answer but um, I feel like last month I had asked a friend of mine who shout out to them because this they did not have to do this and this was just like a wild ass obsession. I had gotten kind of obsessed with Stevie Wonder's drumming in the 70s on his 70s albums, but I also knew that Stevie Wonder would sometimes do this thing right where he'd be like, he's maybe too humble, and so he would like list a drummer on a track in the liner notes but he's actually the drummer. He was so, you know, particular about this where he would like use these aliases and whatnot. And so I had a friend send me the isolated drum tracks from these Stevie Wonder records in the seventies. And I was listening to the ones from Song in the Key of Life and they're so miraculous. 
like the ones where he's playing, you can hear him like humming the song in his earphones. And so like you hear just this drum track and you hear him humming along and like singing along. And so he's playing like a songwriter and not a composer. And that was so beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. I like called my friends and put them on speaker and held the phone up to the speaker. I was like, y'all have to hear this. I can't. And it wasn't a thing where I was like, I want to hoard this to myself so that the next time someone brings up Stevie Wonder, I can be like, oh, well, guess what I have? I want to be like, I want everyone to have this. I want everyone to have at least access to this. Mm. Um, I mean, of course, this aligns with my like wider political, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like this is very much in line with my like political leanings. And so Object of Sound was this thing for me where I was like, I want to talk to musicians and people who, who make music, but I want to have conversations that feel like accessible to everyone. Like, I don't want to have these like high level conversations and I don't want to treat these people like they're elites. You know, I don't want to treat, I want to have conversations with people I admire and, and love a lot. I want to have conversations with people who I'm lucky enough to call friends. Like, the, I mean, the, the episode with Julian Baker, I think was so beautiful to get to do because, you know, we love each other a great deal as, as artists and respect each other as friends. Um, the episode with Michelle and Diego Cello was stunning because like, I had never spoken to her in my life, but had been such a big fan. And when we got to talking, it was like, oh, it feels like we've been traveling towards each other this whole time. Like, how do we mm-hmm. make that a thing, you know? Uh, she felt very much like a living ancestor to me. And I try not to be, I try to, tr- like, I'm, I tread lightly with that, um, especially with, with Black folks who are not men, because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, like, overdo the thing where it's like, you're like, like a parent to me. But, but Michelle Indigo Chabot is very much the, the brilliance and the, the way that she moves through the world. Anyway, I say all this to say I wanted Object to Sound to feel accessible. And I also wanted the opportunity to make playlists every single week and invite people into the world I was building sonically. And um, it's all about shared excitement. I get, I, it makes me so happy when people are like, I listened and I made a playlist of my own and, and they send them to me. And because that's the whole thing. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to sit on high and be like, this is what you need to listen to. I kind of very much want to be like, I want to hear what you're listening to, period. Send it to me. So, um, I'm trying to be more thoughtful about com- like listening as a communal practice, especially mm-hmm. as we're far away from each other. Mm-hmm. Our next question is from Wes Matthews, who asks. What? <laughs> Everyone's here. Yeah, everyone is. Hi, Wes. Um, what is one very small obsession that you've developed recently over the course of the last year or so? Um, it's wild. It's unfortunate that people can't see the chat. Because I would put this, Wes wrote a brilliant piece um, at 6805, the site I run. He wrote a piece on Mariah Carey that was so great. Um, and I would encourage everyone to go look it up, 6805.com in the essay section. There are a lot of great essays. But Wes wrote a really great essay and, and like it hit me up, you know, or I put out like a call for pitches for Mariah Week with everyone writing about a Mariah Carey essay. And Wes was kind of, and I knew Wes's work, you know, like obviously for those of us who are in the poetry community, you know, Wes is a, of a lineage of, of great poetics, you know what I mean? Um, but Wes had hit me up and was kind of like, you know, I wasn't, um, <laughs> I wasn't even born when this album came out, but I think that offers me like a good perspective on it. And I was like, yeah, you know what I mean? Like, cause so often, and I promise I'm gonna get to the, to the answer, but so often we get people like me or like critics like me or my age who are writing about albums before we were born. It's seen as this more acceptable thing because of our age range or because of our generation. And so like, if I write about an album from the seventies, people are going to be like, well, he wasn't born when that happened, but this is like acceptable. But we, I think that one thing that I would love to see normalize are like younger writers and younger critics being like, I'm going to write about this album from the nineties before I was born. And people being like, that's also normal. Like that's, that's also the engagement with music is, is such that that happens. So really grateful for, for Wes's work in general, but on that essay too. Um, as well, <laughs> the Stevie Wonder thing is an obsession that is, that has really flooded my, um, flooded my brain lately, but also I'm a big fan. I don't know why I'm a big fan of this, but like, I'm a big fan of getting items for like no money that need to be repaired, even if I don't know how to repair them. Uh, and so early, and I actually posted a photo of this chair that is on my Instagram if you want to scroll back and find it, but early in like November, perhaps, or October, I got this really fucked up chair uh, at just like a flea. And the person who sold it to me, you know, and the fabric was hanging off and the fabric was beautiful, but it was really destroyed, like hanging off and cut and all this. And the person was like, listen, 10 bucks, but you gotta, I can't, you gotta upholster this. And I was like, of course, yeah, 
you know, I can do that. And then I got home and I was like, how am I, I never upholstered a chair before. Like, what the fuck am I going to do with this? Um, and then I got, uh, I have to shout out this upholsterer named Nicole Crowder, who's like a black woman who does upholstery, um, was out of DC and now is out of Minneapolis, I think. But I just watched a ton of her videos, like how-to videos, and just did it little by little over the course of a month. And I got it done. Um, I'm not going to get into upholstery as a hobby, but it was a, it was an obsession that filled my winter. Another thing is, I recently acquired this. I'm not going to be able to do. I think I got a little too gassed up off of, off the of upholstery, and I was like, I want. I've been long time. I've been long searching for like an old grandfather clock, like a Swedish grandfather clock, like a Mora clock, which is shaped. For those who don't know, it's like shaped pretty odd, but they're painted beautifully, they have beautiful flowers on them. And I found one that does not. It's like broken for sure. And it was like $35. And I was like, cool, cool, cool. I'm gonna get it. And then I'm gonna just work on it. And then I got it to the house and I opened it up and looked inside and I was like, ah, I don't know about this one. <laughs> you know, like this is maybe outside the realm of my understanding, but a part of my, um, a weird obsession of mine has been rescuing things, uh, mm -hmm. not people and not like animals. I already have one rescue dog uh, who I love a great deal but like the rescuing of things, which has been a weird obsession that I'm, I hope I grow out of soon because my <laughs> skills are immensely limited. Uh, there's another, there's a question from um, Gianni Ponce who says, when there's so much to write about as a cultural critic, how do you decide what you'll give your energy to? I'm just, like, I'm a big asker of questions before committing pen to paper, right? Mm -hmm. and the first question I ask always is, am I the person I want to read on this? And that requires real honesty, honesty, which is sometimes easier than others. Like, for example, when when Lemonade came out, right, when Lemonade dropped, I was like, yo, I love, I love, love this. And then I, I never at once thought I should write about it. But the question of, am I the person I want to read on this is the easy no, you know, for something like Lemonade. Um, it's a little bit harder when I think about other things that I feel more adjacent to or passionate about. Um, but I think it's a vital question. Recently, when DMX passed, a bunch of people reached out, like, do you want to write something for this publication or whatever, whatever? And that was another moment where I was like, right now, am I the person I want to, I would want to read on this? And the answer was no. I did not think I could effectively contextualize and celebrate DMX while also wrestling with the complications I felt about some of his lyrical content specifically. And so then it becomes a work of how can I pass this off to someone who I know is better? Which honestly, like that's the move. Earlier in my career, I'd just be like, I'm not the one for this, bye. Not that harshly, but you know. And now I think I've gotten so good at being, now because I've read so widely and expanded my network of just like hitting people up when I love something they've written. Now I'm on some, now I'm always like, I'm not the person for this, but you know who is, is this person. Um, and then the second question I ask myself is, can I add anything new to this? Can I tell, can I overturn some part of this story or present it in a way that is a bit new? And if the two answers to those questions are yes, then I think I need to set out to at least sketching out the work. And again, giving myself permission to revoke those yeses as the work arrives, right? Because sometimes, I'll think I'm someone I want to hear on this and I get to writing it and I have to be able to say, no, 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 you're not the one for this. Or sometimes I think I can uncover something new and then I get to writing it and I get to chipping away at it and I have to say, not right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a lot more patient as I've gotten older. I don't really feel the need to respond to things in real time. And that allows me too to really be patient with myself in the things I choose to write. And I always try to tell younger critics you don't have to write right now. You don't have to write the thing in response right now. Spend some time with it. Spend some time with these thoughts. And if they're good enough, they're going to be good enough. The reason I started 6805 in part was because I wanted to tell people, like, it's okay to write about that album from 50 years ago with no peg, with no anniversary, with no anything. To just say, I want to write about this, so I'm going to do it. And I think that's vital. There is a question from um, Clara LeMager who says, thank you for this reading and conversation. How can we hear the Stevie Wonder drumming and humming? It's on a hard drive that was only sent to me that I actually 
not, and this is not me hoarding it. I actually legally cannot upload it to the internet or trust me, I would have by now. Um, but I can't, it's like, I maybe shouldn't have even mentioned it perhaps due to, I feel like they're going to like, someone is going to kick down my door right now and confiscate my whatever. Um, but I also hope that maybe I can, I don't know, maybe I'll think, maybe I'll think on this more and see if I can like do a Zoom listening party if that would violate the the terms of the of my getting this thing. Cause I don't even think I'm supposed to have it, but I do. Yeah. Sorry guys. Sorry y'all. <laughs> uh Isabella Pelota Goyce says, thank you for answering these questions so thoughtfully. Do you have any tips for aspiring cultural critics? Other than the one I just said about like not responding immediately or not feeling pulled to respond immediately. Um I think it's also important to be generous with yourself and understand that a big, big thing I always try to tell critics, especially critics of color, but especially black critics, is that you're not like obligated to cover just one thing or orbit just one thing. You're not obligated to be, the writer Cord Jefferson wrote this piece that I always reference called The Race Beat, where he wrote about how he was so often only reached out to for issues of capital R race. And it, it stripped him of an ability to be engaging and generous when it came to other topics that he was immensely invested in, right? And I think one thing that I did early on in my career was really resist these reach outs when the capital B bad things happened, you know? Um, and instead carve out in a set of interests for myself that were varied and as varied as I am. So many of the young cultural critics I know, particularly Black ones, have so many interests that are actually not about articulating trauma or not about providing answers for the American empire of curiosity. Uh, it, it, not about all this stuff. And they have had to assert that about themselves at great cost. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Sometimes at great cost, but it's worth it, I think, to... It is worth it to fight for the multitudinous nature of your interests and curiosities and passions. You have to. It's a requirement. You know what I mean? Um, not to keep plugging 68 to 5, <laughs> but another reason I started it was because I wanted to tell people, like, listen, I don't care what album you write about. You know, like if I'm reaching out to you and I'm just asking you to write about an album, you can come to me or whatever, and I'm going to honor it. You know, I'm not going to be like, hmm, but you seem like you would be interested in writing about this, which is so much of how the editorial process had worked for mm -hmm. so long. People hitting you up like, I saw your tweet. Do you want to write 2,000 words on this? And it's like, no, man, I just wanted to write a tweet, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, I'm not, I, it's so I, I will say, like, fight for the multitudinous nature of your, of your passions and your obsessions. Because uh, if you don't, you, you could get rolled over really easily and be pigeonholed really easily. And I think all of us deserve more than that. Do you want to say anything um, more about uh, 68 to 05? No, I mean, <laughs> I've said so much about it. Go, if you want to go check it out, it's it's been a bit stagnant for a bit because I've been putting the book out. But this week, I got a great essay drop in um, and a lot of great essays coming. I think Kerwin has an essay coming, if I'm not sure, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Um, I haven't logged into the email in like a week and a half, but a lot of great essays are coming. And so um, I'm, I'm excited to to kind of push those out into the world. Uh, there's a question from Paige Pulsine who's, who asks, do you have a particular writing process or practice? I wish, I <laughs> wish I had a better practice. Um, it's Ramadan now. And so I kind of have a practice that revolves around um, Ramadan and, and, and this is just a much more structured time for me. Um, and so, yes, kind of, but also, you know, for me, I got to be honest, like my, with all things Ramadan, like the first two weeks are really structured for me and then they go out the window in a wild way. And so after this, like after this week, it's going to be like the wild west for me, I'm just <laughs> going to be doing whatever, moving from hour to hour. Um, um, but I, I do think that um, my greatest practice is that I don't, feel bad on the days I don't write mm -hmm. and I don't punish myself for not being productive in the way that capitalism might demand I'd be productive 
And I instead expand my definition of productivity to be more generous, to understand fully, like I said, kind of before we started the Q&A, that I'm like many more things, but not only, I'm not only many more things other than being a writer, I have to be many more things before I can effectively write. Mm. Like before I can effectively write, I have to check certain boxes of my personhood so that I can enter the work fully and thoughtfully and not be punishing even throughout the process of the work. And so, so much of my process does revolve around um, understanding that productivity is also being a good friend. Productivity is also Mm -hmm. taking my dog for a walk. Productivity is also going on a run if I'm up for it. These kind of things. And not only thinking about productivity as language on the page. Mm -hmm. Jayla Road asks, uh, what book has been most impactful in your life so far? And also, how have you spent your time during the pandemic? Jazz, I mean, the answer to me is Jazz by Toni Morrison and uh, Or Their Eyes Are Watching God by mm-hmm. Hurston or um, The People Could Fly by Virginia Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Of those three, two of them are Ohioans. Um, but, you know, they all mean so much. I mean, Miss Morrison means so much to me beyond word, like beyond language. And I, if anyone has followed my work at, or interviews at all, like you've seen me talk about what Toni Morrison means to me, probably, so I won't go into it here. But uh, Jazz is a book that reformatted my brain in a lot of ways and mm-hmm. their eyes are watching God gave me a permission to kind of write in the language that I was hearing in my neighborhoods and my communities. And um, the people could fly is like a, the first time I kind of saw black folk tales come to life in a way that as a young kid, I was young. I feel like people could fly was one of my first books maybe. Um, and it was wild to just see black folk tales come to life in that way. And I'm so grateful for those three women and, and what they offered. Um, mm-hmm. What I'm doing during the house, I mean, well, I mean, what is it? What are any of us doing? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I guess I released a book, and that that's you know something that's taken up my time. Um, I taught my dog how to play soccer really effectively well last summer, last summer and fall, um, and so now every day, like after this, I'm gonna go and play in the backyard with her. We like play every day. Uh, <laughs> And I say, I mean, really play, like she knows how to kick a ball into, or like, you know, like with her paws, push a ball into a goal Um, or her nose, paws or nose, depending on what she's up for. Um, And and so that is something I've done. And, you know, working on 6805 and making a lot of playlists and um, trying to really like commune with the homies in whatever way we can, you know, like I'm someone who has friends all over like my, my dearest and closest friends are here in Columbus, but I have friends all over and I haven't seen them in since February of last year, in some cases, well before that. And find a way to commune um, virtually or phone-wise or anything that brings us closer to each other. Um, okay, so I know we're coming down to our last few minutes. So, um, uh, oh, there's another... <laughs> Um, Claire, who asked a question about um, Stevie, the Stevie Wonder clip, said, "Ah, hi, I didn't mean to call you out. Are there any oh, subjects okay. you want to be writing slash speaking on more, or that you're um, starting to be interested in?" Um, Ramadan Mubarak. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, I mean, I'm always open to, like, now I'm writing more about basketball, um, even though I've been writing about basketball kind of sporadically, but I'm doing it more now, more intention. Um, I am interested in kind of writing about the way I've evolved into, a, I think, someone who's become so much more curious and eager to pursue tenderness as I've aged and um, in how, even though I know it's happening, I'm aware of it's happening and I'm thankful for it happening, I'm still very curious about that desire and how it came to life. Um, and how I think I've kind of like inadvertently stumbled towards reformatting the ideas of masculinity that I held so closely in my teens and early 20s. Um, you know, almost, I mean, with, with intention, of course, but almost like in some ways without intention, where I just come kind of like, I'm just really eager for tenderness and however mm-hmm. it arrives. Um, so I think about writing about that. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have anything interesting to say about that. So any writing I do on that probably won't see the light of day but publicly. But I'm interested in pursuing mm-hmm. those thoughts and words. I mean, another thing is that I don't, I write so many things that I don't necessarily share with people, but that I still need to write. Mm-hmm. 
Um, <laughs> this unfortunately is going to be our last question, and I feel bad oh, that no. this is what it's going to be. Um, oh, no. But just for my intents and purposes, um, I know very little about sneakers, but I'm a big fan of Lil Nas X. So I am yeah. very curious to hear your thoughts on the Satan shoes. I, um, so here's the thing. And those who know me a little know, I'm just a mess. I have like a pretty intense sneaker collection. I'm a big sneaker person. I, I have an aesthetic answer and I have an emotional answer. And I'll give the emotional answer first. I love the Satan shoes and everything surrounding them just because they've like made a lot of corny people mad. Uh, like that video made a lot of like made a lot of corny people angry. And so I'm with that uh, always. Also, I just think Lil Nas X is so good at the internet, like in a way that is, uh, and I know like you can talk, some people have talked to like, well, you know, internet generation, but no, no, no. I think like no. even within that context, he is so much better at the internet than almost everyone else. Um, it's actually like fascinating to me, you know, uh i can't it's hard for me to process and almost by like sheer will it makes it to me and i'm someone who like loved old town road did not as much love the ep i thought there was a little bit but i i think it, i get to a point where it's like i don't know and I, I like the new song a lot um but i think he's operating at a level that that is such in terms of brand building which is i cringe to say <laughs> um that is going to make it to the point where people aren't even going to have that but they're going to buy his music but not think about it in terms of like quality it'll be about like mm -hmm. consuming the whole of the person mm -hmm. uh which of course is religious in some ways um i don't know if i will be one of those people because i'm still going to be like i want to hear what the music is doing and i do hope that he can i think he is evolving as a musician and i hope that continues the shoes aesthetically um I think the Air Max 97 as a, as a silhouette, as a sneaker silhouette, is my least favorite Air Max. Only because it's like, it looks weird. If you're looking down at them, they look like weird. Um, and if you're looking at them from the side, they look good, but they're a little wide and bulky. But I actually like, so I don't know if people know this, and I'm surprised it hasn't gotten talked about a lot more. Mischief, who collaborated with him, now I feel like I'm sneaker man's playing. Uh, <laughs> But Mischief, who collaborated with him on the Satan shoes, also released a shoe. I don't know if this was in the news at all. I guess I had Holy Water in it for a while. It yeah. was like a Nike Air Max 97 that had Holy the Water Jordans in it. Jordans or something. Yeah. And so I kind of like that they have also gone to the dark side here. <laughs> um, but uh, I, don't, I don't know if I think the shoe looks good. Like, <laughs> aesthetically, from a sneaker standpoint, it is not my taste. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do love the things surrounding it. I will say that um, uh, this is not, I hope people do not read this as a full in, or even partial endorsement of Satan, <laughs> but it is perhaps simply an acknowledgement of the fact that Satan certainly exists in some form somewhere. Um, well, thank you again so much for um, that your reading and for answering um, so many questions. Um, and I hope Everybody has a great night. Thank y'all. This was a real pleasure and everyone be safe and be good.